Hi everyone, welcome to today's webinar all about emergency response monitoring. How to use wireless monitoring to protect people and infrastructure. Thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Amna Youssef, I'm the events and marketing exec here at SNC. I will be your moderator for today's webinar. So just some um, housekeeping notes. Please feel free to type questions into the question box as the webinar goes along and at the end we'll have a short Q&A session. Um, and just to let you know, this webinar will be recorded and sent out to all registrants afterwards. Um, you can also find our emergency monitoring brochure in the handout section. So now I'd like to introduce you to our speaker today, Chris Emery. Chris has a background in geological sciences and worked in instrumentation and monitoring for many years before making the transition to Sensi in 2020. And he's currently the VP of Global Sales and Support. So over to you, Chris. Thank you, Amna. Uh, yeah, good afternoon, everyone. Good morning to those in the in the US and West Coast. Uh, I can still see there's a few people uh, logging in, but we will make a start because we haven't got loads of uh, well, it's not loads of time allocated to, to today's session. So, uh, without further ado, I'll um, I'll start the, the kind of the formal element of the presentation. The intention is, you know, we do 20, 25 minutes of of me speaking, and then the last five, 10 minutes, um, kind of more Q and A. So, as Amna said, please. Uh, as and when you've got questions, feel free to lodge them so they're ready for us to, to review at the, the end of the, the, the formal slide deck. So, yeah, uh, today's uh, theme is, is emergency monitoring, emergency response monitoring. So, just a quick agenda for for what we're going to run through quickly. I'm going to I'm going to cover you know a, a, a definition. You know, what do we mean by an emergency? What do we mean by emergency monitoring? Uh, and then move that into you know, what would the objectives and, and criteria be of uh, emergency monitoring systems and, and approaches uh, versus perhaps more traditional uh, and, and kind of methodic, method, methodical monitoring. Um, and then most of our time, hopefully, is to kind of go in running through five different case studies, you know, different applications, different emergency responses uh, and slightly different approaches. Uh, just to give some context as to, as to how you know technology like ours is being used around the world to to deal with these situations, and then finally you know the the Q and A session. So what do we mean by an emergency? Um, you know I, I kind of looked at this and, and sort of pulled out three strong terms and then some suggestions, some some examples, and perhaps some context around those. So the first one being you know I think emergencies tend to be unplanned, um, uh, and if we kind of apply that to to monitoring, it might mean uh, that uh, monitoring is required outside of, a, of an area that was defined to have monitoring or already has some sort of monitoring uh, happening, um, you know, or uh, monitoring is, is required earlier than anticipated. So, you know, you may have had a clear plan, but something's happened that's driven the, the need to, to uh, accelerate or to, to introduce monitoring um, far earlier than scheduled or, or even, you know, that it wasn't intended in the first place. Uh, the next kind of big pillar, I think, is is, is that it's unpredicted. Um, you know, predicting and planning are, are two different things. Um, unpredictable. You know, we kind of then move into the the subject matter of natural hazards. Uh, very diff difficult to predict, particularly seismic events. Um, but also, you know, if we talk about uh, predictability, then um, structures and assets, I would say, tend to have some sort of predictable behaviour, uh, or we like to to uh, predict the behavior of, of assets and structures. And, and there's, you know, often times that perhaps leaves uh, engineers perplexed because the, the behavior of, of said structure or, or asset is, uh, has, has, has been uh, unpredictable or has behaved in a way that was not intended or, or not suspected. And, and that can typically be linked with an event, whether that's natural hazard or, or some sort of major human event. And finally, um, you know, I believe that emergency tends to go hand in hand with a with a reactive nature as opposed to proactive so again you know we think about catastrophic failures and us and the need for us to respond both from a safety perspective and a recovery perspective uh, and then you know the same with uh, with disasters natural disasters or, or human disasters so if we uh, if we kind of add some i guess some examples to to those Four, three or four definitions uh, in in the world of infrastructure, and and certainly where monitoring perhaps would have a have a, a role to play. Um, if we look at rail, I mean, there's a good example last year um, on the UK railway railway network rail. So this was January 2023. About 300 meters worth of 
of embankment failed, obviously uh, unpredicted, unplanned and unforecasted. Uh, it shut the line. You could see the impact of the track uh, quite clearly. Um, and it needed, uh, you know, some significant emergency response. The next could be something, uh, you know, a bit more of an environmental impact. So this is a, a quite unfortunately quite a famous tailings failure in Brazil. So this was uh, in 2019, uh, just east of Brumandino in Minas Gerais in, in Brazil. Uh, you know, a major failure to the tailings dam and, and subsequently, you know, kind of thousands of cubic uh, tons of, of kind of contaminated tailings material uh kind of escaped and and infiltrated the environment the water system and, and impacted many uh towns villages cities uh, and the environment downstream uh a little bit more kind of suburban um you know this was in 2018 this was a this was a brand new uh overpass public footpath uh, footbridge kind of going over a, a busy street in florida uh this was in the process of being commissioned it's a brand new structure uh, and they were they were stress testing it and and then and, and kind of undergoing the final kind of cable tightening uh, on the bridge when it when it all of a sudden had catastrophically failed. You know, I think I believe in this situation there was loss of life as well. So, you know, hugely impactful and, and certainly uh, unexpected. And then finally, and one we'll cover towards the end of uh, of this presentation is um, uh, Notre Dame Cathedral in Paris. So one of you know the iconic uh, Gothic architectures in the world back in April 2019 caught on fire you know massive damage massive damage and and you know left a superstructure that was unstable and and you know still sat right in the middle of central Paris so there was a, a risk to the remaining building but also a risk to the surrounding area and the people uh, that you know needed to kind of uh, cross nearby you know is it a growing problem or has this been around for a long time well I mean one of the big Kind of precursory indices that we look at is obviously kind of global population growth. You know the 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 rate of uh, of kind of our conquering of the of the globe is uh, uh, is significant and has kind of exponentially grown over the last hundred years. You know, kind of 120 years ago we were below two billion, and this year we're, we're, we're capping with topping out above uh, eight billion. You know, the reality is, is that infrastructure uh, you know, hasn't kept up with that sort of uh, demand or, or usage. You know, we're building a lot of new, but we're also having to keep a lot of existing and, and, and quite old infrastructure in good working order. Um, and I think in many cases that infrastructure is subject to kind of uh, demand that was that was unforeseen, unexpected and undesigned for. Uh, and then you kind of maybe combine that with. Uh, what we're seeing uh, in terms of climate change, you know, a, a general warming of the world globally and, and we're, year over year we tend to be hitting higher and higher sort of average temperatures ever recorded. Um, so, you know, there's, there's extremes happening from a population perspective and an extreme uh, extremes happening from, uh, from climate uh, perspective. And, you know, one example would be to look at things like uh, rainfall and, and hurricanes. So, you know, Scientists are pretty confident that they're seeing for every one degree of, of average warming, we're seeing around seven to ten percent in increase in rainfall. The challenge with that is that it's not it's not shared around the world. You know, it's 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 uh, the rainfall is more concentrated in areas. So that some areas are subject to far higher uh, increases in rainfall, and, and that's bringing with it catastrophic damage. Uh, and the same, you know, with hurricanes, I think the we're impacting the the global kind of climate and the the climate systems. So hurricanes and and storms and typhoons in the in the Pacific uh, region, they seem to be increasing in number and also increasing in severity. So our infrastructure is exposed to far more significant uh, events that you know plays a part uh, and impairs damage on them, and, and they have to withstand you know forces far more often than perhaps they were intended to. So, you know, is there a need for monitoring and, and when do we monitor? Um, the ideal situation in, in any scenario, not just emergency response, but, but you know, what we typically kind of uh, think of when we talk about uh, remote monitoring or automated monitoring uh, is that these systems go in uh, before any sort of movement or event happens, you know, whether that's construction or, or general asset management. The idea is that you deploy a, a, a completely fit for purpose and and tailored solution that um, gives you a, a great stable baseline from which you can 
uh, predict and, and analyze uh, rate of change uh, from. Uh, and, 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 uh, and most solutions or deployments around the world tend to be in that category. Um, then there's, you know, I guess the kind of the, the next preferred stage, which is perhaps as things are detected or, or just before, you know, systems and technology is deployed uh, as an early warning system for when uh, movements or events happen. Um, and, and that being a way of monitoring the impact in a live environment. Um, and, and taking decisions, whether they're safety related or engineering related, uh, as and when you know you need to based on that live data feed. And then finally, uh, which is you know more of the topic of today, um, is the managing of and, and recovery and repair process after an event happens. So in effect, putting in a monitoring system, you know, after the major situation has occurred, just to really understand the fallout. The first two, you know, I think. You know, we tend to define as proactive uh, and um, you know there's a particular feature set within the sensitive solutions that, that we you know our infraguard sort of portfolio that really kind of supports and, and aids that around dynamic sampling and, and proactive triggering um, I'm not really going to touch too uh, too much on infraguard today uh, it gets a mention in a case study but there's a lot of content that we have available for that there's plenty of webinars already pre-recorded and uh, I believe you know further ones in the, in the schedule and the calendar for the rest of this year that you know gives a far better overview and detailed uh, kind of subject matter around in regard. I'm actually going to focus on you know the the nature of the, the kind of the third one, this reactive type monitoring, and and really kind of what what's its mission and and what um you know what can we expect from from the technology that's out there. So, you know, to that point, if we look at the, the react, that point number three, reactive monitoring and, and start to kind of maybe define and, and put some objectives and some criteria around what a system or the technologies or the approach should really do. Um, you know, I started to, to kind of pull together a few kind of, again, main pillars and, and, and some uh, expansion around that. So the first thing I think typically with, with, with reactive and emergency response monitoring is speed. And, and that's that's speed of, of getting the equipment to, to location so a logistical challenge uh, and some maybe a little bit of forethought on on having equipment readily available but also you know it's important that this stuff is easy to install and can be installed quickly and simply perhaps with with um, you know relative um, relatively low experience on the equipment so you know there's that there's that simplicity element um, but also once it's installed, you know, how quickly does it become operational? You know, how quickly is that data backhauling and becoming available for consumption and for interpretation? Um, and I think that's vitally important for, for you know, what goes into or, or how you define best options for, for react emergency response and reactive monitoring. The next is, uh, is flexibility and, and, uh, and having that kind of ad adaptable kind of capability. So when we look at, uh, you know, the term flexible, the system ideally sits on a shelf. If you if you have emergency equipment kind of uh, set up or, or or available, the ultimate goal is for not to be used. Uh, so it needs to sit on the on on the shelf, um, unencumbered and 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 not uh, in a place where the longer it sits on the shelf, uh, the more you know kind of the, the lower the performance when it's used. So it needs to be plug and play. It also needs to be. Um, easily stored and, and, and can sit there dormant without anyone any sort of maintenance and concern around it. And it also from a flexibility standpoint needs to have a wide remit. So, uh, you know, do you have a, a technology or, or a portfolio of technology that, that can be adapted to different uh, emergency response situations as opposed to purely focusing on one technology or, or one parameter and it only being fit for purpose if, if that's the parameter in question. And then finally, you know, whatever you decide on and whatever you deploy, it's got to be valuable. It's got to be insightful. Um, and then that brings in a, a kind of an open question around, you know, having the perfect solution, which, you know, if you're in that proactive uh, and um, pre uh, zone where you want, where you're planning and, and designing a perfect fit for purpose system, you know, you'd expect that to be perfect. But when we're in a reactive nature, a responsive uh, environment, there's certainly the question around good enough. You know, what have I got that can do a job that can be uh, useful and, and impactful um, and ultimately, you know, drive safety or aid the recovery or the engineering decisions that need to be taken that perhaps is not 
how we'd design the optimal system if we had all of the time available to us and a lot of a lot of uh, uh, resources, whether that's you know money or t or, or or engineering expertise, plenty of time in advance. So you know you've got to get those three things balanced well: um, speed, flexibility, and insightfulness. And 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 that's I think really why we've had a number of uh, a number of situations where our partners around the world have kind of um, been involved in some pretty high profile emergency response scenarios because the technology does lend itself in many cases to, to these three pillars. So uh, with that in mind, I believe there's a time for a poll which Amla's going to launch. So if you could all kind of see the question pop up and, and take a minute or two just to, to answer that and then we'll, um, we'll, we'll draw out the answers when we move into the Q&A at, at the end of the session. So, Amla, just let me know when to move on, will you? Yeah, I will do. Ready? Okay, yeah, you can move on. Yeah. All right, so we'll move on. We'll look at those results at the at the end. So thanks for, for filling that out for those that did. Um, so, yeah, I think we've you know, kind of covered the objectives and the criteria for, for what or how you would uh, think about emergency monitoring solutions. So moving that into something a little bit specific to Sensive is, is the notion of an emergency response or emergency monitoring kit. So uh, a lot of our customers have, have, have you know, taken, taken it on uh, as a task to kind of pull together kits that are, you know, have a long shelf life because the, the equipment can, can stay in, um, in kind of sleep mode, as we call it. So not impacting the battery life of the sensors, uh, can go in a nice contained peli case, so easily transportable. To, to meet that kind of speed of deployment, speed to get to location. Um, and within it, you know, they can kind of really pick and choose what sensors and, and what is the makeup of the portfolio in there so that they have that flexibility um, and that perhaps that uh, perfect versus good enough concept of mind. So um, the idea is that these kits are, you know, include sensors, the cameras, so the, the measuring and the monitoring equipment themselves. Obviously, everything's wireless, so, so the, the ease of install is, is, is straightforward, and, and a lot of the configuration around the, the communication, the gateway device, is, is, is already preset. So the moment it's activated, you know, everything's looking for that, that gateway, and it all connects seamlessly and backhauls to the, to the software. Uh, included is the, is the power unit, the solar power panel unit for, for the gateway. So again, you're not thinking about needing to get power or electricity or communication to the to the site because the, the gateway's got cellular and the power comes from the solar panel and the, and the sensors themselves, you know, have 10 to 15 year battery life when they're activated. Obviously it's indefinite when they're in sleep mode. Um, it can all be kind of pre, uh, pre-configured into a particular, into a project uh, in our software or, or set up in our um, kind of integration environment to, to, to push the data to third party visualization. So there's an element of planning that can be done in advance that is, is just means that once it's activated, that data is immediately available uh, and can be kind of drawn into some sort of uh, uh, kind of conclusive uh, analysis. Um, the kits themselves, you know, we don't define the kits, they're customizable based on, on the thoughts and needs of, of the, the customer and perhaps what, what emergency situations they're thinking about. You know, we have a, a, a range of sensors, an array of different interface sensors that can be pulled in there to allow for a wide, a wide parameter kind of kit. Um, yeah, and as I mentioned already, you know, the, the bonus of everything kind of being stored in sleep mode just means that it's got that long shelf life. Um, so kind of covering the, I guess, the, the, the types of parameters that we've seen many of our customers sort of include within the within their emergency kit. So first one being tilt and rotation, you know, Sensi obviously deploys uh, many thousands of tilt sensors a year uh, across many different application types. So they typically tend to be part of the kit. You know, rotation is a, is a very useful parameter in many situations. Visual with the camera, um, again, it's all remotely powered and operated camera. So you can get eyes on site or even you know utilize infraguard from a triggering perspective uh temperature we have you know sensors that can read temperature and connect to temperature sensors and environmental sensors um we have interface sensors that can uh connect or can monitor you know uh gauges that look at crack stress and strain so perhaps if you're looking at kind of more structural uh emergency response you know elements that are you know under fatigue or under uh, unforeseen stresses and pressures, you know, you might want to put some equipment on, on that type of application. D 
distance and displacement. Um, you know, our, we have a, a, a laser disto sensor called the optical displacement sensor that, that can look at rate of the change in distance uh, to give you those types of parameters. Uh, and, you know, we have also have the ability to pull in a number of different sort of geotechnical uh, sensors, one being water level, if we we're looking at uh, piezometric uh, piezometers and, and um, kind of water standpipes, but equally, you know, a number of other uh, geotech sensors, load cells, pressure cells, uh, IPIs, etc. So yeah, and, and it really is a kind of a you know it's a it's a list, it's a shopping list that that, it, that different users have, have kind of pulled from and, and put together uh, as as what they deem as a as a you know a flexible and, and ready to deploy emergency response kit. So now I'm going to kind of move on to some some of the case studies. I think we've got five here and about 10 minutes to come to cover those. So the first one being from, uh, you know, only a couple of weeks ago. So um, moving from 2020, December 23 into January 24. Uh, this is on the network rail uh, infrastructure in the UK on the, on the eastern region, actually on the, the I think it's the East Coast, Coast Main Line, which is the London to Edinburgh line with a number of significant sort of cities on the way. Uh, there was a, an unexpected and unforeseen slip on the embankment um, and it actually impacted uh, one of the overhead line gantries. So um, for those that don't know, the UK's got both third rail for power, but also over OLE 25,000 uh, kilovolt electricity lines that, that power our trains up and down the country. Uh, and they're all supported by these you know, large aluminium gantries. Um, and where the, the slip was it actually impacted a gantry, at least one gantry. Um, and our partner of ours, SCP Rail, were, were contacted, uh, you know, under uh, emergency to kind of get some equipment and get some monitoring out there so they could understand that the damage and, and, uh, and aid the, the repair and remediation work. So, so SCP used the, the combination of both, you know, traditional survey, uh, manual observations, as well as, you know, some sensitive equipment to, to get, uh, you know, high, high frequency, you know, kind of more real time reporting on, on the structures and, and on the, uh, the embankment. Uh, one of the things they noticed um, because of the, 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 the speed at which they got the equipment out on site was that the OLE, the, the gantry, started to move uh, as the ground sort of continued to fail. So, and, and they could see early signs of this um, the moment the system was installed and, and you know, SEP basically kind of informed and guided the, the recovery team um, that this was happening and it, and it prevented what they suspected would have been a complete failure of the gantry onto the railway, which would have brought down, you know, a few tens of metres, if not hundreds of metres of, of power cabling and, and, you know, exacerbated the recovery and the damage further. Um, what the monitoring allowed them to do was, was actually alter the piling design, the sheet piling that was being used to kind of strengthen everything and recover the situation. They, they altered that on site based on the monitoring data um, and, and were able to get everything, you know, back under control and stable and recovered without any sort of additional impact to the railway, no further damage or, or delay. So, you know, a really good example of, of getting equipment out on site quickly, but then using it to, to guide and, and steer the emergency response. Another example is from uh, uh, southern France. So there was uh, Storm Alex, which um, I believe was 2020. Uh, let's have a look. Uh, yes, 2020. Um, kind of ripped through the uh, UK and Europe, and uh, it caused a, 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 some serious flooding in southeastern France. Um, and one building in particular in a, in a town called Saint Lazare um, was the hospital where there was a huge washout and exposure of, of the foundations, uh, and also damage to those foundations once the, the kind of the storm uh, flood water, the surge went through. So um, our partner Geomajur and their customer Ionix kind of got called up in a emergency sort of uh, conditions and asked what they could do to help understand the, the, the hospital um, and, um, and what they could use to help um, monitor it as they you know, stabilize it and try to recover, recover the situation. So um, ultimately, I think because of the, 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 uh, the site conditions, the river and, um, and the extens extensive damage to the surrounding area, not just the hospital, I think you know traditional optical monitoring was, was quickly sort of dismissed as, as non-viable uh, and they went with a wireless solution so they put a load of sensors on the on the structure and in and around the, these exposed foundations and piles themselves um, put it at a pretty high reporting frequency so they could really understand 
Um, and whilst they'd evacuated, obviously, all the patients and the surrounding buildings, they could, uh, the emergency repair teams could set about um, kind of recovering it, stabilizing it, uh, as well as ensuring the safety of the workers whilst the, the sensitive system was reporting at such a harm, such a high frequency uh, and to a, you know, a relatively high degree of accuracy um, with all of the team on site kind of uh, linked into the immediate SMS and email alert. So if anything was to start to indicate movement, all of them would receive, receive the text messages and, and evacuate the situation. A different application uh, over in the US. So up in the state of Vermont, um, this is the East Bar Dam. So there was a, a manual inspection that, that identified quite a, a significant movement in one of the panels on the dam. Um, and, uh, and, you know, it was obviously un, unexpected, unforecasted. So um, the, the, the dam engineering uh, and maintenance sort of department quickly uh, looked at some solutions and, and they brought in a, an emergency response kit uh, that um, leveraged the camera technology and the InfraGuard kind of um, dynamic sampling uh, technology that, that that kind of camera can come with. Um, one of the, yeah, as you can see, I've kind of highlighted it here, where, the, where it slipped from, from its normal position. Uh, one of the main concerns was, you know, is this the start of something major? You know, there was many towns sort of downstream from the dam. so any failure was going to cause significant damage and, and, and also they needed to be able to warn uh, the residents for, for evacuation purposes should there be any, any trends uh, suggesting that more failure was going to occur. So they, um, yeah, they installed uh, both optical displacement sensors and tilt sensors on the panelling itself, so on the, the panels in question and the, and the surrounding ones to look at you know, what's stable, what's moving, and then they set up a, one of our kind of 4G infrared cameras opposite so that they could monitor um, monitor the situation and get visuals on the situation in you know what was a pretty severe winter so um, I think temperatures got as low as minus 30 degrees centigrade minus 22 Fahrenheit um, and, and they didn't really want engineers out there kind of monitoring it by eye uh, in what would be quite you know hypothermic conditions so um, fortunately you know the, the system determined that actually after the, the initial slip everything was stable and, uh, and after a, a period of monitoring and, and being satisfied that it had stabilized, all of the kit was removed and redeployed uh, on, on more conventional uh, projects elsewhere. But um, it was uh, yeah, it's certainly a good use of the InfraGuard camera to remove humans from you know pretty tough environment uh, in, in monitoring that as from an emergency perspective. Uh, and yeah, that's the paneling question that we had on the photo uh, earlier. So. Uh, Second to last example, I know I touched on it earlier, but the, the Notre Dame Cathedral in Paris. So um, I think it made global news, but obviously 2019, a, a fairly significant and catastrophic fire ripped through the building, um, you know, destroyed the roof and, um, and as well as many kind of supporting and, and foundational elements to the building. Um, and, you know, once the fire was under control, there was there was two things, right? They needed to understand how structurally safe it was uh, regardless of, of the fact that it's in central Paris, um, but also President Macron, you know, committed to it being refurbished and reopened in time for the Paris Olympics, which, you know, is the this summer 2024. So uh, the, 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 the kind of the disaster recovery team, the, the engineering team called in a, a structural health monitoring uh, expert company called Osmos um, and, and asked them to kind of consider a, a solution and propose one. The challenge here being that a lot of um, temporary works was, was established, you know, scaffolding, support infrastructure, um, a uh, kind of covering and, and um, uh, yeah, kind of, um, what's the right word? Hoarding was a set up around the, the damaged roofs, the damaged foundations, and, you know, not least of which to make it watertight at the top. So line of sight and the complexity of an ever-changing kind of temporary works environment meant cabled or, or survey type solutions was was, a not, was really a non-starter so they they actually went with a with a wireless solution so they installed a network of our wireless tilt sensors you know um all via sort of adhesive fixings because the other thing they didn't want to do is, is put you know intrusive uh, fixtures into centuries old <coughs> centuries centuries old uh, brickwork 
because of the mesh capabilities of the sensors, you know, all line of sight wasn't an issue and, and the mesh was able to self heal around an ever changing kind of work environment as, as engineers set about trying to recover the, um, uh, the building. This was also kind of uh, at the time of COVID. So the fire happened pre COVID and then all of the repair work and the monitoring had to happen during the pandemic. So again, once they installed it once, there was really uh, a, uh, uh, a movement to try and avoid going back to site as much as possible. It was, you know, early 2020, everything was in lockdown um, and, uh, and they were able to use kind of both their own support and our customer support to kind of guide the, the engineering teams on, on what elements were structurally safe and, and what were braced and what needed to be repaired or replaced. Um, and, and, you know, as of last week, I believe uh, the actual famous spire was revealed, re-revealed to the public um, because they've started to, to tear down the scaffolding and the, and the, and the hoarding um, in time for the Olympics. So they're on course to, to meet that uh, promise from President Macron. And then finally, another kind of significant event that hit the news last year, uh, there was a major earthquake in, in southern Turkey around the city of uh, Gaziantep. So I think it hit 7.8 on the Richter scale. Richter scale. Um, and it leveled huge swathes of Turkey, you know, principally around the city of Gaziantep. Uh, and, you know, in the immediate aftermath of, of the, the, the earthquake hours, days, you know, obviously emergency services descended on the city to, to start searching for survivors and, and clearing up the rubble and trying to make the environment safe. Um, and one of the things they needed to understand was, you know, the, the buildings and the structures that are still standing, are they how fragile or how stable are they? Are they going to collapse once we start disrupting the rubble or can we kind of work and go about our recovery um, kind of projects uh, safely uh, and keep the, the emergency response workers safe as well as any you know, survivors? So a pretty innovative, innovative idea, but our um, you know, partner in Turkey, a company called Paxoy, they'd already kind of pre-thought about these types of scenarios. Tur Turkey does sit on a major plate boundary and, and is subject to, to significant earthquakes. So they'd already worked with um, governmental ju uh, jurisdictions to, to set up these kind of emergency response vans. Uh, and, and literally within the van, they have a, you know, a, a podium that can be um, risen up through the roof with our sensors. In this case, the, the optical displacement sensors can be attached to that podium. You can kind of see them see them at the top there. The idea being that they can park right in the, in the epicenter of the, of the area that's, that's under, uh, under surveillance and, and then start looking at relative distance changes between the van and, um, and the facades of buildings that they've got concerns about. Um, so, you know, again, it comes back to that perfect versus, fit, uh, versus good enough, right? In terms of what, the, the the disaster recovery needed here it was good enough to give early warning is it a stable and perfect situation that you know would, would kind of comply with engineering best practice absolutely not but it, it delivered exactly what it needed to uh in that kind of horrendous situation and and they were actually monitoring and looking at the data all of the infrastructure was in the in the back of the van so the the monitoring engineers from Paxloy were sat there looking at the live data and um and conveying any concerns and messages out to the to the engineering and the and the uh, the clear up crews uh, and it made you know i think it was it was so appreciated that it made for certainly turkish news and these are a couple of screenshots from from uh, the turkish news channel where they they were talking about the the contribution that this system was doing towards the disaster relief and then focused in on the software you know looking at um distance change and what that might mean for for building stability uh, and then afterwards, obviously, the, the, the sensors were, were brought down from the gantries, all loaded back up into the van and, and removed and parked up, ready for, a, a, you know, a, unfortunately, another, another event like this that might happen in the future. So that brings to the end of the formal presentation. Um, I guess you move it on to any questions. And, and first, I think, Emily, you've probably got the poll results that you could, you could talk people through. Yeah, let me just launch the results. Okay, so I think everyone can see 35% um, of people voted for speed, ease of installation. Uh, we got 12% for frequency, speed, um, data capture. Then we have 24% for flexibility of system and then 24% for sudden movement detection. Um, and then we got 6% for the last one, which was good enough to aid the response, but not perfect. Okay, interesting. 
Uh, so any questions, I guess, from now on? Cool, let me just go through the questions. So the first question is, how much monitoring expertise is needed by the people installing an emergency monitoring kit? Yeah, uh, good question. So in terms of the, 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 the knowledge around sort of detailed monitoring, I would say not a lot. I think the, if you go down these types of technologies, um, you know, either that Sensi provide or similar, um, most of them are very easy to install with kind of basic, I'd say DIY or, or kind of uh, uh, installation uh, practices, you know, drill and fix, adhesive. So um, having people that are confident with, with, you know, that type of installation methodology is important. Um, but being a, a, a monitoring engineer is, is certainly not critical for, for getting sensors installed and, and making sure that they, they are, you know, providing, you know, useful enough data. Thanks. We've got another question here um, that's asking, how long does one of the tilt sensors take to install? Uh, seconds, I would say kind of probably, I mean, comfortably under a minute, um, in particular, if you're using adhesive, you know, the, 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 the plate is can be already installed on the sensor. You would add the adhesive and, and then it's just a question of letting the, the adhesive uh, go off and cure before it provides a, a structurally stable base to monitor from. But in terms of physical installation, again, if you know what you're doing um, with some basic training, it's comfortably under a minute per sensor. So another one is, have you seen monitoring where reporting ends up highlighting noise mistaken for data? Uh, noise mistaken, what was the last part of that question? Noise mistaken for data. Noise mistaken for data. Um, yeah, uh, personally, I, 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 I've not seen it. I'm sure there's been situations where it has. Um, one of the disadvantages of reactive systems is you don't get that baseline. So looking at uh, kind of maybe diurnal effects or the general noise of of the uh, the environment, whether it's triggered by you know kind of human activities, uh, excavation work or not, um, it's difficult to kind of filter out. Um, so there is an element of having to really look at that and, and understand what's happening on site to see if there's any direct correlation. But um, I've, the examples we showed you know, today didn't have that issue. Um, but I couldn't categorically say it's not been a factor in, in other deployments. OK, I think we'll do two more because we are a bit over time. Um, so another one is, can the sensors still detect structural or ground movement if there is vibration and noise, for example, from con construction plant or trains? Yeah, so. Um... The, the overall answer is yes. Uh, you know, we have we have a, a capability in our sensors to filter out uh, what we deem as high vibration, high noise that is not uh, of a structural origin. Um, so, and, and a lot of it also depends on your sampling. You know, what your chosen sampling rate is. So, um, you know, more often than not, uh, and if you use that kind of filtering capability on on the sensors themselves, you can remove uh, external influences and and you know really dial down on the actual kind of uh, parameter in question and that you've got concern about. Cool, okay, I will just do the last one. So can the kit be re reused at other sites in the future? If so, would it need to be recalibrated? Uh, very much so in terms of reused. I think the the, the advantages of, of wireless systems and, and small nodes and, and sensors like, like the ones that we offer are that they can be recovered, you know, quickly uh, and kind of stored easily. So, um, you know, um, as I mentioned around the battery life and putting them into sleep mode, all of that aids the ability to recover and redeploy. With regards to calibration, um, that's really on a case-by-case -case basis. I generally, uh, I'm more often than not, it's not needed to because people handle the equipment with care but you know it is a it is a calibrated sensor in the first instance so if, if it's dropped or, or it's kind of undergone something significant and and you know there's concerns about the integrity of the sensor when it comes off site then you know that they can be recalibrated and, and made ready to go again but most of the time people you know customers and users look after them and when they're recovered they're stored correctly and, and they're fit for purpose for another op opportunity Okay, I think we can end it there. I feel like we're 10 minutes over, but 
Good. Well, look, thank you very much for joining. Um, sorry, we're 10 minutes over, um, but appreciate your time today from wherever you join in the world. And um, yeah, the information recordings will be sent out. And if there's any any further questions, uh, there's a number of email addresses I think you've already been provided with and, and certainly, you know, reach out directly to myself and, and we'll follow up in due course. So thank you very much for listening and um, enjoy the rest of your days. Thank you. Bye.